Hi, and welcome back. If you joined me yesterday, or welcome here if this is your, your first time joining me on Facebook Live. Great to see you here. Um, all right. Got a good crowd already. Um, and yesterday's hour we spent together was all about the practice mindset. So if the idea is practice makes performance, then how do you set that up from the very beginning? All the decisions, all the, the mindset that you can have before you even put the, the bow to the string. We did do a little playing, um, especially on the first page of the Mendelssohn Concerto. Um, but it's all, that was all about how to set yourself up for success in practice because I find that too much of the time, and this especially this used to be true of me, spending too much of the time practicing frustrated and failing rather than succeeding and moving forward and ultimately getting closer to that performance that we really want. So, all right. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, so today uh, is going to be a lot of, lot of information and, um, of course, time for some questions and discussion too. But it's going to get more into the nitty-gritty I call today to talk about tools or the tool set or the tool kit. Um, what are all the things that we need as violinists to be able to open a brand new piece of music and, you know, not to sight read it perfectly right from the beginning, but to feel confident like, you know, we, I can handle this. You know, I'm going to have to practice this and that, move it toward performance, but there's nothing in here that I can't do. That's what I want to feel like when I open a new piece of music. Um, so some of the tools that we need to build and maintain, scales, etudes, exercises. Now, there are about a billion kinds of scales and etudes, right? So it's how do you know what to practice and especially what to do every day? Should it be the same routine every day? Um, so my answer to that is probably not. And is it going to be the same for every person? Definitely not. Um, so what I always advise people is just get some experience handling all the different tools, right? Scales, everyone should do every day. That's, that's a given. You don't have to do them the same way every day, and not every person will do them the same. But scales, that's a given. Get experience with different etudes, working different aspects of the left hand, the right hand. And then you may find that you want to invent some exercises that will strengthen some weaknesses. And of course, as we talked about yesterday, when you reach the limits of your own knowledge and experience, that's when you need a guide, a mentor, someone to step in and say, you know, actually, you, you think this is a real problem. It's not that big a deal. Here's a real weakness, though, that you need to focus your time on. And here are the, the etudes, the exercises that would really help you with that. Um, great. Welcome. Welcome. Even more folks, familiar faces, familiar names. Great to see you here. Um, so yeah, this is day two of three. Tomorrow is how to bring it together with practice techniques. That's going to be more about how to organize your time and how to best use your time and use these tools we're going to build today to move your pieces toward performance. Um, let's talk about, before we even get to scales, let's talk about that, that basic building block of sound, which is the, the detaché bow stroke. And it just means separate bows, right? And the default detaché would be fairly connected. Could be long bows, could be full bows, could be slow, could be fast, but it's detaché. It means that the bows are separate, but there's a connection between them. And actually, all the other bow strokes come from that simple detaché. So if you can master that, and that's actually not that, hard. Then you can build all the other strokes from that. I once saw a great demonstration of that in person uh, by Pincus Zuckerman. 
And I think he's done this demo for quite a few people. I don't think I was the only lucky one. Uh, but I was asking him a question about some bow stroke, and he said, look, it's simple. They all just come from this. So here's a... Uh, I wish he were here to sit under the lights and do it for you, but I'll do my best um, Zuckerman impression, at least as far as explaining the strokes. If you do the detaché with a little bit more bite at the beginning, which means setting a little weight into the string, and you can tell you're doing that right because the stick will get closer to the hair. By the way, I have about a pencil width between the stick and the hair at the narrowest point there. So if I set the bow with a little bit of weight or pressure, whatever you want to call it in there, and then release it, then we can call that marcato, we can call it um, martelet, but the point is that we have a little consonant at the beginning of the stroke. And I get that again by releasing that pressure that I've put in before the note starts. So set and release. The easiest way and the best way, um, the best image or model that I have to create that weight or that pressure is to press my thumb up into the stick. I have my thumb right on the leather of the bow there. And while, the, uh, you know, while everything else on the bow, I'm lifting my fingers now to make it easier to see, but I press that thumb up and that, you know, because the thumb is the fulcrum or the lever there, so that moves the stick down toward the hair. I find that a little healthier thought than pressing down with the first finger, which wants to make my arm raise up and it introduces tension into my hand and arm. If I just think that the thumb pushes up a little into the leather, that's a really easy, subtle, and very effective way to set the bow. Then I release it. This way I don't have to think of stopping the bow in between these strokes. It's just a new press up to set the next note. If that's a little difficult at first, you can stop. Reset with the thumb and <laughs> release. I'm looking in strange places now. The cole stroke is just a much shorter version of that. And for some people think it ends on the string. Some people think it ends off the string. It's kind of pizzicato with the bow. So it's consonant and very short. Um, martelet, uh, sorry, the on-string staccato. You simply keep the bow moving in the same direction. And that, of course, can be faster. We more often do it up bow than down bow. When you take the bow off the string, for spiccato or sautier, and I know this is heresy to some people, I don't really make a distinction between spiccato and sautier. They're all off the string strokes that incorporate, you know, they, depending on your bow stick, they may happen in different parts of the bow. They may come off the string different amounts. You may feel different parts of the hand or arm getting involved, but they all let the stick of the bow do the work. And so when you want to take a stroke off the string. It's still a detaché. It just happens maybe half an inch above the string. But everything here stays the same. Make it faster. And you know, the height of the bounce, all that gets into what kind of sound, what character of sound you make. But it's just a detaché that's a little bit off the string. After that, you've got the three variables, right? Of bow speed, bow pressure, and contact point, all of which affect the kind of sound we want. But all those strokes come from the basic detaché stroke. You get to decide how much consonant is at the front of the note, what the length of the note is, 
how much space there may or may not be between that note and the next note, and whether it's an on the string stroke or an off the string stroke. And among between all those questions, you've got a bunch of different bow strokes that you can work on, but they all come from that basic one. And I get a lot of questions about um, bow changes. And um, again, I'm, I'm in debt to a demonstration I saw from um, Joseph Silverstein, the former concertmaster of the Boston Symphony, on this question. Um, someone asked him, you know, what should happen during a bow change with the, the hand and the fingers? And um, he said, for a great bow change, you know, here's what should happen in the hand and the fingers and the arm, nothing. Um, and when we watched him, it was true. Beautiful bow changes, and it looked like nothing was happening. <laughs> So on the up bow stroke, um, it's as if I'm uh, cresting a hill or maybe pushing a, a light weight up a slope. And when I get to the top, I just release it. If I'm rolling that ball up a hill, when I get to the top of the hill, I release that ball and it rolls back down. There's no effort required in the ball going back down the hill. So on the up bow, gently pushing it up. I can feel it pressing against my hand, the ball or stone or whatever you want to think about. When we get to the top, I just release it and it comes back down. So there's no trickery needed there. This is made easier, by the way, if the level of your arm is similar, it's probably going to be a little lower, but similar to the level of your hand. So let me try and find a nice angle here. On the E string, A, now a couple of things uh, when you see me do this, partly because I play without a shoulder rest, my violin sits flatter than many people's would. Um, depending on your shoulder rest, you may see that your violin is tilted more like this. Some shoulder rest setups really have it like that. <laughs> and that puts the G-string level here. For me, the G-string level is here. So if it appears that my arm is high, it's just at the level of the G-string here. What I see from many folks um, is that their arm is kept low all the time. So it works well for the E-string but then they're asking their hand to make the change to the different strings. The arm is lagging behind. And that is likely to result in some improper weight balance there at the frog. Tip, it's a similar thing. Nothing really happens. Sometimes instead of thinking of just a straight direction change down up, I might think of a subtle little circle. So I'm coming down bow like this, up bow like that, a little bit that I play on the two sides of the string. Here I exaggerate it. A figure eight if you like. You don't have to get too fancy with that, but that may help in some cases, especially for a really slow bow if I want to think of a smooth change. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts or questions so far on ju just this, this basic data shape bow stroke and how it leads to the other ones. Um, where I'd like to go after we uh, get a few questions about that is to scales and arpeggios and then finish with some etudes. Um, whew, I really feel like I'm zipping through this or maybe you feel like I'm giving you too many details. But um, I'm curious to see what questions you have. I'm, I'm actually going to start with one that uh, Rudy emailed to me. And he was asking about um, keeping a straight bow and a good contact point. Um, the straight bow, <laughs> that's something I, I remember my first teacher, my Suzuki teacher, I think from the time I was six or seven, she promised me I could, you know, she'd give me coupons for the local ice cream place, or maybe it was gift certificates to the local ice cream place if I could make it through a whole song with a straight bow. Um, 
and for a couple of years I kept asking about it, like, did I get it? And she said, no, it wasn't straight. And eventually I forgot about it. And, you know, by the time I left her and I was 10, ice cream wasn't a big, as big a deal to me as it had been. Finally, one, I was a teenager, 14 or 15 years old, and I was playing some, you know, a much bigger piece. And afterward, I saw, oh, there's, you know, there's Mrs. Weehee, there's my Suzuki teacher. And she said, you know, great performance as always, congratulations, you know, I'm so proud, and here you go. And those were my gift certificates to the ice cream place, because I'd finally, after more than 10 years of playing, made it through the straight bump. Um, here's one quick thing, if you haven't tried this, and apologies if it's not totally, you know, if I'm not uh, square to the camera, this may not appear to be a straight bow. But you can use a mirror and make sure your bow is straight at the tip. Once it is, now I can do this without an assistant, you may want an assistant, but get that bow at the tip nice and straight, then come around the other side of the violin and hold on to the tip of the bow. Now you can move your bow hand up and down the stick. And the, keep your thumb and all the fingers in contact with the stick as you do. And the motion that your hand and your arm make will trace the exact path that it will need to make for a straight bow later on. But you know, everybody's got to use the mirror at some point to figure out their straight bow. It doesn't have to be too complicated. Either you're bowing down out too far this way or bowing down too far in this way. Um, contact point goes along with straight bow, so I find it's probably easier to get a basic straight bow path first and then decide what your contact point's going to be. Contact point's one of those things that needs to become a habit. You're always going to have to remember to, okay, what's my contact point? Eventually your ear gets the message. You'll be able to hear what your contact point is, and you'll be able to hear if it's uh, away from what you want. All right, got a lot of good questions already. Bow quivers or bow shakes in the middle. Ah. Um, I, I wrote, well, I've written one article about it, and I've made one video about it. Um, so the, the video, I believe, is called um, The Safety Move to Prevent Bow Shakes. Um, so that is going to give a more detailed explanation than I can go into here, but it involves rolling the stick a little bit. That's kind of your emergency if it's happening and you can't stop it. Look, the bow's going to shake more. For example, I had coffee this morning. It's going to shake more when you have coffee or if your blood sugar's low or something like that. Um, some sticks are shakier than others. Um, the worst thing to do if the bow starts to shake is to you know, lighten your fingers and lengthen the fingers and try, you know, that's, for some reason, that's one of the first things that people do. The thing is, if you let the bow stick alone, it's going to want to bounce. So doing that gives away all your control. It's going to keep happening. In general, I like to pick the bow up into my hand, have the stick a little close to the hand, in general, closer than many people. Decently firm fingers, and then just play through the shake if it wants to shimmy keep that bow moving you can draw it toward the bridge a little bit row your way into the bridge and then just realize that it's not the worst thing in the world um, the audience never notices it as much as you do you'll get through it um, i've seen very few people that have actual weaknesses in their technique that cause the shakes um, it's usually something that comes and goes, and it happens to everybody. Um, again, as far as the story, there was a teacher I saw give a master class, and someone had the shakes, and this teacher really came down hard on them and said, um, you know, back in my day, you know, if you had the shakes, that meant that you just couldn't cut it. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, mess around with terms like whatever, like dealing with it. We didn't have beta blockers. We didn't have these. It, that just meant that you, you didn't have the, the stomach to play. And unfortunately, this teacher had to play a solo pretty soon thereafter with a really, you know, so I think it was the lark ascending, whatever it is. And, 
and it started shaking and it would not stop. <laughs> and they were trying everything to, you know, get rid of it and it just wasn't happening. So happens to everyone. Um, all right, I'm going to need to give shorter answers. And my opinion of sautier being an extension of a detaché moving from the arm to the wrist. <sighs> yes, I, I, I get that image. I think that, you know, for most people, sautier is faster than spiccato, right? And so the faster the stroke, the more is probably going to be happening a little bit in the smaller joints than the bigger ones. So I would agree that there would be a little bit more happening here. For example, if I'm playing, I'll probably notice everything moving together. When I start to speed it up, the arm will move a little less and, and more of it will be happening here. It's not something I think of consciously. But I'm sure you can see it happening there. And that's a great ex exercise to do to make the smooth transition. F partly for that reason, I myself don't make a distinction between two techniques, like this is spiccato and this is sautier. It just, it's something that I feel as I make the transition. So one more time. And you can see the motion going from more arm to less arm. Um, my thoughts on sound. Well, let's, I'm going to be speaking about sound um, this whole session, I'm sure. Um, but the sound is basically formed besides the vibrato, which puts uh, you know, your fingerprint on your sound. The kind of sound and the, 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 the amount of sound and the quality, amount and quality, are determined by those three variables, both speed, both pressure, and the contact point. There are so many combinations of those three that produce an acceptable sound, and which everybody's got their default, right? Some soloists, you'll hear their default is more the slow bow, more pressure, closer to the bridge. That's a combination that works. Others, maybe their default is closer to that. Fast bow, less pressure away from the bridge. And then there's the whole range in between. And that's part of our job is to instantly be able to hear, OK, this is a combination that, that works. Is it the best combination for this part of the music? Um, so I've talked about the correct wrist and hand motions for bow changes at the frog, which is almost, almost nothing. I will say one more thing I forgot to mention is that for some people, it's helpful to imagine, too, that when you transition, you know, bow chains at the frog, almost always tougher than ones at the tip, right? So I'll focus here. For some people, it's helpful to imagine that during the up bow, we're weighted a little bit more toward the finger, the first finger side of things. And then as you make the transition, we bring that weight over to the pinky side so that we're not trying to change direction only like this, but there's a subtle a little shifting of the weight to the pinky side. I'm trying to exaggerate it a little bit now, but that helps many people as well. Um, yes, thank you, Paolo, for mentioning breathing. I neglected to mention that breath of life, right? We need that for anything we do, whether it's athletic or violinistic, paying attention to where you're breathing gets tight or constricted will definitely give you good clues about how you can release, where you can release tension. Uh, the bow grip, I advise to have it as close as possible to how your hand would just normally hang or how you might shake hands with someone. You know, the fingers aren't bunched together, they're not apart, and they're certainly not, <laughs> you don't have three of them and then one finger <laughs> set apart from the rest. Some people learned to do it that way, or maybe not consciously, but it ended up that way because they wanted to get more and more pressure on the bow. But as I said before, you really don't need that much pressure on the bow. The pressure you do need can come 
just from pushing up with the thumb. So having this out only adds tension here in the arm, and it only encourages cranking that arm up, which is just terrible in so many ways. So the grip, as close to this as possible. I'll sit this down here. Here's how my fingers basically hang. I'm just going to put them on the bow like that, put the thumb on the leather, and there's, there's the hold. Um, good. I'm going to move on for now, just so that we can talk about scales and etudes, and if I can, I'll, I'll get to some more of these great, great questions, really great. Um, scales, something that you, you've really got to do every day. <laughs> and I just said got to, that already makes it sound like it's short. Scales can really be anything you want them to be. The great thing about scales is that you can put etudes, you can turn a scale into an etude, um, just as you can turn an etude into a piece. Um, it all comes from that mindset that we talked about yesterday, that every bow stroke you draw should lead to that performance. So it's for this reason that I practice my scales as though I had an audience. Um, and I do start the day slowly. I don't take the violin out of the case and try to play my fastest scale. But unlike some people, I do like to get those scales fast. When I first started working on scales, that took at least a couple of months to get fast and fluid scales. But now that I'm in, you know, regular practice, um, I do some fast scales every day. So I have a little progression that takes me from slow to fast. And the reason is that there are fast scales in pieces. So I want always to have those in my fingers and I want them to be fluid, clear, and clean. I practice my scales with three main bow strokes, one separate bow, one slurred, and one off the string. Um, and that's because the timing is a little bit different for those three. So I'll explain. If we take the simplest thing, which is just a slurred scale, when I put my finger down, that's when the note changes automatically, right? Um, when I lift my finger up, that's when the note changes. If that is not clean, then there's got to be some issue with the way I'm dropping the fingers or lifting them, right? That lack of cleanliness means that I'm putting the finger down way too slowly, right? There's that transition. That's obvious, right? What's not always so obvious is when you're lifting the fingers too slowly. Many people do lift their fingers too slowly without energy. And that can sound, again, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of people have some of that sound in any descending passage, and that's the reason. Those fingers are not lifting with energy. So the slurred scales will tell me if I'm even and if my fingers are placing and lifting um, efficiently and with decent energy. By the way, I like to place gently and lift with energy. Um, I place as gently as I can while stopping the string um, firmly. I don't press in past that. And I made a video about this that some of you may have seen called Finding Your MVP, Minimum Violin Pressure. So that's slurred scales. And as I said, I'll start them off slowly. I just want to play them in tune. I'm not going to play them faster than I can play them in tune. Etc. Um, about vibrato, again, because I'm practicing these with an eye toward performance, if, I, if I'm playing in a tempo where I would vibrate in a piece, then I'm going to vibrate in the scale um, because I want that practice vibrating the shifts. And in a slow tempo, I, d I practice expressive shifts because they're often neglected. When the tempo gets faster, there's not time for vibrato, and I'll do the shifts more efficiently 
that they wouldn't be heard in a fast passage. It's kind of a medium tempo, right? So I'm hearing the shifts a little, but they're efficient. As it gets faster, of course, no vibrato, and those shifts will happen quicker and later. Therefore, you won't hear them hardly at all. But they're still going to be the same kind of shift. I'm not doing a different kind of shift. Um, that's for slurred scales. Now, I also do them separate, including fast separate scales. And that's something that many, many people neglect. The reason you've got to practice that is because um, it tests the timing, the coordination between the two hands. And that's so often a weakness. Um, it's great if you can play, uh, you know, slurred passages rapidly, like in Last Movement of Mendelssohn. But, um, Can you play them separate when those come up? Uh, whether it's on the string or off. So for on the string playing, the bow change and the finger change have to happen simultaneously. So again, I do that slowly. Or with the vibrato. and I get faster, eventually about to the same speed as I would play the slurred ones. And if I'm hearing, I exaggerate, but if I hear a lack of coordination, then I've got to figure out what's causing that, what's the speed where that's happening. Finally, off the string scales, because again, here the timing is a little different. For off the string, your finger has to be in place before the bow gets there. including the first finger moving over to the new string. Same for descending. The finger's got to lift while the bow's in the air. It's a different feel. One good tip for getting that feel is to practice pizzicato, by the way. I owe Simon Fisher for, for this one. Somehow when we play pits, our hands know that the finger has to be there ready in advance. And so it's the great way to feel that timing that's necessary for the off the string coordination. Um, then when you go back to the bow, hopefully you keep that timing. I don't know why it is that our brain makes that connection so easily with pits, but with the bow, sometimes our hands try to fool us and do everything simultaneously and it doesn't work. That's when you'll get the... Either the sound is bad because the string isn't stopped all the way, or you get the, the coordination is off. Um, so those are the three bow strokes with which I would do all my scales. Um, let me see if we've got any questions related to this right now. Um, Yes, as far as keys, keys and metronome, those are two good issues to touch on. Um, if you're just starting out doing scales, I think it's better to stick with one key during the day and really take your time with it. To do these three bow strokes, to, if you're doing two octave scales, make sure those two octaves in, are in tune. If you're doing three octaves, play them only at tempos where they're in tune and with a great sound. And then to call it a day. And if you're just starting out, I might stick with the same key for three days. Something like this would vary person to person. But something like that, that you can get really comfortable and feel yourself improving day to day. Again, really don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't expect that you're going to take it from slow to fast in one day, unless you're already in excellent shape, regular scale practice. Um, you know, you can get it a little faster but your guide has to be your ear. Is it dead in tune and does it have a great sound? If not, then you're asking too much of yourself for where you are right now. For me, um, I do about three keys a day um, and that will include the single note scales with the three bow strokes. 
arpeggios in the three bow strokes and double stops in the three bow strokes. Um, for me, the double stops I focus on are thirds and octaves, just basic one, four octaves. Um, so I'll do all of that for three keys. Now that process goes a lot faster for me than it will for most people because I've done it for a long time. Um, so I might spend 10 minutes per key or less and for, for maybe half an hour total of scales. Um, don't try to do all that um, if it's going to take you two hours um, because you, there are other things you can do with your practice. Um, and I'm going to get to double stops here because they're so important. Um, but that's what I would say about keys. And the point of varying the keys, obviously, is because we play music in all different keys. What's nice is if you can keep the same fingering pattern for all of them so that you can, you have that confidence, you know, you get to a, or we see this in orchestra all the time, right? We've got something in E major, and then it comes back and it's an F. It's the exact same pattern, right? And so you can use the same fingerings. Later on, it's great to branch out and try some other fingerings, but it, in the beginning, and actually for a good long while, it's nice to keep it simple. For the metronome, I don't. Um, I don't do my scales with the metronome. If there was a time when I did some of that um, just to help build my internal pulse, um, but I find that it's actually, it either limits me in other words, I could go faster, but instead I'm trying to fit it into this metronome box um, and that prevents me from building the fluency that I'd like. Or, more often, it's pushing me to go faster than I'm really comfortable doing, listening for intonation and great sound. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, when I hear people practicing scales with the metronome, it's not in tune. It's because they're trying to stick with the metronome and that's too fast for where they are at the moment. Um, yes, great question as far as the scale book is really not, I don't want to say it's unimportant. I mean, the book is only important in that it prompts you to work on the things that you need help with. Um, you know, the flesh book is kind of the, it's the gold standard that everyone talks about. I mean, I find it's a little overkill, to be honest. Um, and for example, the thirds are, scales and thirds are written out, if I remember correctly. Et cetera. Going up and down and up and down. I mean, that's, that's fine. That's a fine way to do it. Um, is it any better than just doing a scale up and down? I, not necessarily. Um, so there are great ideas in the flesh book, but you don't have to follow it to the letter and you don't have to do all the stuff on the, yeah there are just i forget how many sections there are for every key 13 or 15 or something like that if you really do all that every day it takes forever and i think there's a point of diminishing returns you should be working on the things that you need help with and my pared down routine is a great baseline for most people to practice the three strokes in regular scales arpeggios and double stops um, yeah, and that's exactly um, Alderman's comment. Too much information, how do you prioritize it? That's my way of, of doing it. Three strokes, three kinds of scales, regular, arpeggio, and double stop. Um, let me, just a brief word on double stops. If, there's, if you're going to pick one, have it be octaves. And the reason is because the octave of 1-4 sets your hand frame. If you can't play octaves comfortably, usually it means that you have, you've not found a good hand position for the fourth finger. When you choose your basic left hand setup, which includes such things as, you know, how far are you going to be from the fingerboard? Um, how high is the thumb going to be? Where is your arm? going to be what needs to dictate the answers to all those questions are how the fingers fall on the string especially three and four 
So I could have my hand kind of far from the fingerboard like this. One and two feel nice and comfortable, but then four I've got to reach up for. That's not a good solution to playing the violin uh, because first of all, I'm not going to be able to vibrate well on the fourth finger like that. And it's got to reach so much further, the four, than the other fingers. I'm going to have problems with evenness. What I want instead, and this depends on the length of your fingers, the length of your arm, you want a way that three and four can sit pretty comfortably on there. And then you're reaching back for one and two. Many people are surprised, but this is actually a healthier position to have three and four nice and comfortable, reach back for one and two. And that will tell you how far this is going to be from the fingerboard. It'll tell you where your arm needs to be to get those fingers in that place, etc. So for an octave, have my four comfortable, reach back with the one. And then something about turning in my stool this way is messing up my hand frame. <laughs> the other fingers move within that frame. When you always have that relationship between one and four, you can play anything in any key. And see, I knew it would be better turned back this way in my stool. Um, so octaves would be the one to pick. Nice, only the fingers as, as, as much pressure as you need into the string, no more than that. Um, again, I do vibrato if it's slow enough. When it gets faster, then I don't. When I'm doing it slowly, by the way, I like to hear the space in between the notes, and I like it to be an octave always. But even during the slide between the notes, it's always an octave. Um, okay, before I talk about some etudes, let me see what great questions there are. I'm already afraid I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, okay, the thumb during scale practice, and um, especially since I don't use a, a shoulder rest. It's a great question. Um, so we've got rules of thumb, right? And this you can find in the Galamian book. You know, I'd, Galamian's not right about every last thing, but I found his rules quite helpful as I transitioned to away from the shoulder rest. In these first three positions um, before the hand contacts the rib, right? The, hand, the fingers and the thumb, oops, stepping on the mic cable. The fingers and the thumb can move together, right? When you're going back down, now this is especially without a shoulder rest, but if you ever have a thought that you'd like to transition to no rest, then you'll want to practice this even while you're still using the rest. In the first three positions, when you're shifting back down, like let's say you're going from third to first position, I lead with the thumb. On the way up, they move together. The way back down, the thumb leads. Once we get to fourth position and above, the hand is contacting the rib. Um, now, I don't move all the way around <laughs> and create a bunch of space like many people do. I keep contact with the rib even as I move up. You can see that while still leaving the thumb there, my fingers can reach past the end of the fingerboard. So there's really no need for me to create a whole bunch of extra space. I don't have the world's biggest hands by any means. So. At this point, I'm solidly, you know, I'm in contact with the ribs. The thumb is still here. See? Right around there, it'll start to move around, but it's never going to lose contact 
with the curved part here with the neck. It's never going to move onto the rib. So from every, from fifth position basically, it hasn't moved to there. Still hasn't moved, still hasn't moved. In the Galamian book, he writes that if you're shifting down even to third position, keep the thumb where it was when you started the shift, and then afterward, it catches up. So. Still there, now it goes. So. In fact, on the way up, I can do it with no chin rest either, because it's always pushing the violin into my body. And most of the way down as well. Um, do I practice arpeggios every day? Yes, I do. That's an easy answer. Um, same sound during your scales practice or try to find different types of sound? That's a great question. I, I probably stick to my default rich expressive forte more than I should. Um, sometimes it's nice to do scales later in the day and to work on perhaps weaknesses that you may have. Um, so many people find it a problem to use faster bow and that's a great thing to put into a scale. To get a different kind of sound. So the answer is yes, you should try different kinds of sounds, especially any kinds that are unfamiliar to you. Another one is like... Notes with consonant at the beginning and then letting the bow travel after. That's uncomfortable for many people. So that's a great one. Um, great. Um, let's see. The three bow strokes, just, just to review, the three bow strokes are simple detaché, slurred, and off the string. That, that's what I mean by the three bow strokes for, um, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. Stopping the thumb from popping off the violin when playing in the highest positions. You can develop the flexibility to open up this part of the hand. So that's something I have developed. I don't think I'm, I'm no Paganini. I, I don't have a weird degenerative um, disease or anything like that. But I have noticed that while still keeping contact here, I can open this part of the hand uh, more easily than I used to be able to. That's something that developed for me after I took off the shoulder rest. And then I don't mind extending my fingers a little bit up in these high positions. Some people, you know, feel very strongly that they, they still want their fingers to be shaped kind of like this, even in high positions. And if you're going to do that, then yes, you've got to be coming way over the top like this. I find that crowded and uncomfortable and actually hard to play expressively. Instead, I don't mind having them a little bit extended. Um, you know, it just uh, Don Juan comes to mind, right? The so here, my one is reaching back, and two and three are extended, but it's easy to play a nice vibrato there. Not only is the thumb not popped off, but it's still most of the way around there. If I really needed to get. Um, that high A, then probably the thumb would be centered on the thing there. So I think it's about developing a little more openness there. Um, do I find practicing fun or a chore or both? And definitely both. Um, it's fun when everything is going great. Um, it's a chore when I've come from a rehearsal and I'm tired and I don't want to do it. Um, and it's a chore if I've you know, the kids have been giving me a hard time and then my reward is to go practice. Um, that's where that, that's where that mindset from yesterday is just crucial because, you know, and on days like that, I say, look, I'm going to settle for some small gains. 
<laughs> I'm going to make a good sound. I'm going to play in tune, and I'm going to clear up a couple passages. Um, I'm not going to try to learn, you know, the Bach C major fugue all today. It's going to be some small gains. Maybe we'll call it maintaining, call it keeping some good habits, keeping an open ear. Oh, yeah, that's a good question for this guest. I don't do the Galamian thing. I wonder how many of you know the reason for that. Um, I'm sure many or many of you do, but um, he just added some notes to make a three octave scale 24 notes, right? Because if you don't do that, then it's only, I forget, maybe, I guess 21. Um, so he adds three notes before the, and 24 happens to divide evenly with twos, threes, fours, sixes. And so in that way, he could, you know, because he liked his method, you could slur by twos and threes and fours. Um, I don't bother too much with that. I change bow when I need based on my tempo. Um, practicing scales with a drone. I've done that. I do recommend it to do on a limited basis. Um, it's a nice reality check. You know, it lets you know. It helps develop your inner ear, which is really what you should be developing with scales. Um, I would not do it as a habit because it becomes a crutch, just like practicing always with a metronome becomes a crutch for rhythm and prevents you from developing that inner pulse. So do it, but then turn it off. You know what I mean? Practice with a drone a little bit, and then here's what can be interesting. Record yourself playing without a drone. So in other words, get your pitch from the drone. Then turn the drone off. Record yourself. Etc. Then play back your recording with the drone. See where you were high or low. That's, that's much more effective than always having the drone on while you're playing. Give that a try. Um, good. I want to... Um, okay. Last question before I just speak a little bit about etudes, the last major part of our toolkit. Um, rhythms, bow patterns, Galamian was spot on with this. Those are essential and really neglected. And uh, Heifetz, I'll have you know, was a fiend about rhythms, bow patterns, accents. Um, he would always make his class, make his students try these, you know, two slurred and one separate. <laughs> Five slurred, um, three and two, and put the accents. And they had to be able to do it right on the spot. Actually, he was annoyed if they could do it on the spot. He, he tried to pick things that they weren't going to be able to do. So if they could do it right away, he would get annoyed. <laughs> um, this is because my uh, second teacher, the one I had from age 10 to 18, was in the Heifetz class um, back in the early 70s. Um, but so yes, mix as much of that as you can in your scales or etudes, um, like how I transitioned there to etudes. Um, Kreitzer II, which this violin made famous, um, has a whole bunch of bowing patterns and accents right before it that you're welcome to try and encouraged to try. Um, but what are some other etudes that I consider important. Um, I'm going to name a few, but the thing about etudes, and this is where great guidance comes in, you'll only get the most out of them if you know what the key is. And I don't mean the key is in C major, but what are you supposed to be working on with that etude? I mean, you might randomly happen upon it, uh, but a lot of them, you know, even for an experienced player like me, I didn't get the most out of them until, you know, someone mentioned to me, hey, you know, if you practice it with this in mind, then you'll really work this bow stroke or you really work this aspect. This is the whole point of the etude. And then I do it and, you know, light bulb moment. So um, just to, to mention a few, um, there's a Kreitzer in A major is number 13, and uh, it's basically just stolen from the, the Bach cello thing. 
So this one goes, or you, the point eventually is to do it fast. It's beautiful, it's nice. Um, but the point of that etude is to learn and to feel the difference between two types of string crossings. The kind that go just between two strings, which you can accomplish with the hand. And for that, of course, you want your arm level to be in between those two strings, the, the level that you would use if you were to play a double stop. Or, as opposed to the string crossings that happen over more than two strings, so three strings, you can't ask your hand to do that. That gets everything out of position. So, my arm moves from the G string level to the level that forms the double stop between D and A. So, and now between the two strings, back, between. See, if I don't do that and I try to play this etude fast, it's two pages long, I'm never going to get through the whole thing. This is going to be flopping all around. And you, you, the sound is not right. Instead, you'll see the arm motion, the hand, and then back. Same with the... There, the arm has to do it. As opposed to the... So, Kreitzer 13 builds that and helps you feel it. Um, Kreitzer number nine is a, a doozy. Um, now, until my teacher told me, you know, hey, you, I, I'm sure he didn't call me a dummy, but it was, you know, you've got to be putting two fingers down for that, right? Three and four. And then just lift the four lift two fingers at the same time. So two down at the same time, two up at the same time. If you try to do it the other way, I, it just doesn't even work. You never get it fast. And it's just because of how you put the fingers down. So that trains that idea of putting two fingers down, but then lifting only one. Simple thing in theory, and when you build it up slowly, it really expands your technique. And uh, yeah, th those are the two I'm gonna mention for now. Um, the, I, the etude that Heifetz played every day was, um, well, it was the first two Schreideck etudes. In other words, in most books, it's the first three pages. Um, etc. Um, every day he'd come into the room where his class was being held at USC. All the students would be gathered there. He wouldn't even stop to greet them. He'd walk in, walk straight past them into the little inner room, inner chamber, and then they'd, they listened, they'd hear. And oh, only once he got through those three pages, then he would open the door and say, okay, you know, beginning of class, but every single day. Um, well, I know it's already one Pacific, but I'm not going to, I won't leave until we've talked about some of your questions because you've had some, some great ones. Um, and apologies to those that I missed. There's too much. Um, recommended progression for etudes from Wolfhart to Kreutzer and Rode. Which ones are important according to me? Um, you know, I'll have to admit that I haven't studied all the etude books. Um, and that's partly because, as I said, my teacher, because he studied with Heifetz, 
The big ones for Heifetz were Kreutzer and Don't. Um, and then he said, well, yeah, he, I mean, he said those two books contain, oh, and Shridek, of course. Um, but these books contain, you know, all the techniques you need to know, and past that, you need to be playing repertoire. He's, I think, you know, his line was, you know, why play Gavigny, or, you know, you may as well be playing Paganini. So I know what he's getting at, and um, therefore I never was taught those other etudes. It was basically Schreidek, Sevjek for shifting, uh, Kreitzer, and Don't. I mean, Don't is obviously going to come last of all those because it's, there's so much more going on there. But Don't has a lot of bow techniques that aren't exactly found in those other ones. Um, so I actually never did any wolf art. Um, I think I did a little bit of road, but not not much. So uh, Shridek and Sevjek would be the two I would start with because that teaches playing with in a position, um, making a good sound, and shifting, changing the positions. Um, and then some of the easy Kreutzers can be mixed in at that point. And then after shifting is more comfortable than you do the Kreutzers with shifting. Kreutzers also contain a lot of trill work, which is essential. Um, I made a series of three videos on trills that you can check out if you haven't seen them. Um, let's see. <laughs> Stephen was teaching his junior high orchestra students. Important work. Um, yes, absolutely, Kreutzer 13. <laughs> Prep for Mozart 39. <laughs> So, between two strings, over three strings. Um, is there an etude that helps uh, Bach unaccompanied A minor, like Sevjek etudes for Mendelssohn Concerto? Right. So, Sevjek, if you look in the Sevjek shifting book, <laughs> it's like a billion pages long because he wrote out everything, but Sevjek was, uh, he also wrote preparatory etudes for all these major concertos and showpieces, and those are starting to be published now. I know uh, which one that I see. I know for Scherzo Tarantella, the Vinyowski, the for that one, there's a whole book of Sevjek prep just to play that piece. Um, as far as the Bach A minor, um, I don't know if you're speaking more about the double stop stuff, like the fugue or the last movement that's uh, the... All that stuff. Um, you know, as far as the non-double stop stuff, anything relatively fast with string crossings, like Kreitzer 8. Uh, or not quite as difficult, Kreitzer 2, the famous... Because um, really that Bach single note stuff is about coordination between the two hands, being able to play it in different parts of the bow so that you can shape. Um, Etc. Just getting comfortable with that. Scales would work just as well for that, I believe. The double stop stuff in the fugues, don't number one, for example, has, um, I'm going to distort if I try to play this at real volume because um, it's hard to play three note chords softly, but um, don't number one builds that and that's essential for those Bach fugues. Um, I forget the opus number for the don't, I'm sorry, but it's the one that starts with that, the three note chord one. Um, Let me see the, yes, the, as far as, you know, asking about videos on all the Kreitzers and what they're good for, um, yeah, that's a, a major project. Um, and if, if you come back tomorrow, I'll, I'll let you know what I have in mind as far as that, because I'm not sure that every Kreitzer would be essential, but enough of them are. And, you know, what I'm talking about, knowing the point of each of these etudes 
is essential if you're going to get the most out of them. So, you know, come back tomorrow. I'll talk about practice techniques, how to bring these together. Um, and then I'll let you know what I do have in mind as far as um, making more videos about all these. Um, yeah. Um, okay. There's a couple questions about subject here, and I, I neglected it because we got short on time. But um, the deal with subject and the deal with shifting, yes, I do love guide notes. In my experience, the, the advanced, the professional players that I coach, some of them have a phobia about the guide note, like they, they learned it early on and then decided it was for kids and they totally got away from it. So what we're talking about, um, for example, the first shift of Mendelssohn, the guide note would be a B, right? If you totally give up the guide note and start lifting fingers, you can get away with it for a while, but eventually you, you pay a price. Um, so I generally keep my fingers in the string when I shift. That doesn't mean that you'll hear every one of my shifts because that is determined by the timing. If I do a shift very late and fast, let's pretend that I was going to do Mendelssohn's printed bowing, which is a separate bow there. If I were going to do the printed bowing, then I could choose to let you hear the shift, which doesn't sound great in my opinion. I'm going to do that same kind of shift finger in the string, but it's going to happen right at the very, very end of the down bow. And if I play it in tempo, then you don't hear the shift. So it's always the same kind of shift. There's a guide note, the finger's in the string so that I'm always feeling the distance. But the timing determines how much you hear it or don't hear it. Um, as far as whether I do it rhythmically, I do like to put a rhythm to my shifts. And that depends on the tempo that I'm playing. So if I'm doing it quite slowly, kind of da, 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 dum, bum, something like a triplet. I, I don't always specify it to myself, but there is a rhythm to it. Um, when it gets faster, something like that. I think that's helpful. I wouldn't stick to it dogmatically, but I often talk about the rhythm of a shift being as important as the destination, because you're not going to find that destination unless the rhythm, the choreography of it is there. Um, great. Just a couple more, and I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of the day. Etudes to help with uh, Mendelssohn and Schumann scherzo bow strokes. Um, as far as getting just the basic off-the-string stroke, that's kind of... Um, People find different ways to that. The easiest way, the simplest way that I can think of, is truly to find the on-the-string stroke at that tempo. So, I mean, if we're talking about the Schumann scherzo that's eventually going to go like a... Something like that. I need to find a clean on-the-string stroke. And many people are surprised they can't do that right away. They often flakes out. But to really find that, where in the bow am I going to be? What contact point? Uh, what firmness? Because if I'm not firm enough, the sound's going to flake. How much bow? Okay, there I've just about zeroed in on it. Once I get all of that, I've got a certain pressure into the string, certain amount of bow, contact point, firmness of the fingers. I can feel all those things. Then I can take that just half an inch or a quarter inch above the string. 
keep everything the same. The mistake many people make is that off the string suddenly becomes this other thing. Now, the difficulty with Schumann and Mendelssohn is often, well, the difficulty with Schumann, besides left-hand stuff, which should be worked on separately, for example, slurred. Because if that's not even in, in, in tune, then forget about trying to coordinate it with a staccato. So the difficulty with Schumann generally is the string crossings. And so that you can do without the complication of the fingers. To make sure that you get exactly the strings that you're on. So for that, you know, I'm kind of turning the Schumann scherzo into an etude. But you could just as easily take any detaché etude and play it off the string. Uh, there are a fair number of string crossings there. Just practice. Uh, Etc. to, to fine-tune your string levels. Um, Mendelssohn, the difficulty there is more mixing eighths and sixteenths. And for there it's important to let the bow escape the string, let the bow bounce twice as high for the eighths as for the sixteenths. What I often see is people trying to control the bounce of the bow on the eighth notes. And instead, it should be able to bounce freely. And then that one becomes a lot easier. All right. <laughs> Fun nerding out. That's true. This is a, a violin nerd fest. Um, good. Um, I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your day or evening. I hope nobody's staying up at night for this, <laughs> but if you are, extra special thanks. But yeah, to enjoy the rest of your day. Can't thank you enough for joining me here. We've got more than 100 of us, yeah, as Bello said, nerding out. Um, come back tomorrow, same time, and that is going to, we had practice mindset yesterday, the practice toolkit, the violin toolkit today, the tools. Tomorrow is techniques, practice techniques. So, you know, great, I can play double stops, I've got detaché, I can play spiccato, but now these things come in a piece. Um, how many times do you have to repeat something? Um, how do you know when to practice slowly, to practice in rhythms, uh, to practice small sections and expand? Uh, what do you tackle first? And these are all the kind of things we'll get into tomorrow. And uh, so I hope you'll be with me then too. And let me share just, I forgot a little bit of housekeeping. Um, a link that I want to share. If you haven't yet signed up, which only means that you're giving me your email address so that I can mail you the links to these replays because um, yesterday's session, by the way, is already up on my website, on natesviolin.com. So uh, you guys are here, you're on Facebook. There are people that aren't on Facebook, they want to be able to watch them. So yesterday's is already up. This session is going to be up on my website, as well as I believe still here on Facebook. Uh, that'll happen later today. Here is the link um, that I just put in the comments. Go there if you haven't already, and um, that way when I send the emails with links to these replays or whatever other info, you'll be sure to get it. Um, so again, thanks so much. It was great to spend some time with you here and come back tomorrow for day three of three practice techniques. All right, uh, goodbye from Pasadena. Oh, 3.15 in Indonesia, you did stay up. All right, well, thank you so much. <laughs>